I'm Matt Hagman, and this is Opportunity Miami, a podcast about the people and ideas who are shaping Miami's economic future. To see what drives change and success in a community, all you have to do is look at the educational institutions there. That's what Jamie Marisota, CEO of Lumina Foundation, said recently, and said it at our first Opportunity Miami live event which we did with the Academic Leaders Council, which is a very special group in our community and very special part of Opportunity Miami. It comprises all six presidents of our six colleges and universities across Miami-Dade County, along with our superintendent of schools. And for our first Opportunity Miami Live event, we brought together people across the community with a keynote by Jamie, where he talked very candidly about the challenges in front of us as we think about our education, talent development, and future, and how we're gonna build that next generation workforce. And among other things right now, Jamie said, there are way too many people on the sidelines, and Miami needs to do much, much better in terms of educating and preparing way more people across our community for their professional futures. So for this podcast, we bring you Jamie Marisotis' talk at our first Opportunity Mind live event on our education, talent development, and workforce future. Miami holds a very special place in my heart uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, perhaps the most important is that um, I'm a child of, of immigrants. I grew up in the Northeast. Uh, my parents immigrated from Greece. and. Um, we uh, never really made it to the middle class um, in uh, in striving for the American dream. My parents did not get an education, though they the the one thing that they believed in and that they spent their entire lives working on was making sure that their children all went to college, uh, which did happen. But uh, my parents uh, wanted uh, to take their family on a vacation. Our very first vacation as a family was to Miami. I was eight years old. It was my first airplane trip. I've been coming to Miami for 50, 50 years. Uh, and uh, by the way, we only took two vacations before I went to college. The other was to go to Greece, where, which was the last time my parents ever went there. Um, they never made it back a- after that. So, um, you know, I've had a chance to be here for a number of reasons over the course of many years. In fact, an interesting um, anecdote about uh, my, my own career path, I have the great fortune of holding many honorary degrees, um, including my very first from Miami-Dade College. And so um, very, very privileged to be here. So thank you. You know, I've often said that if you want to see what drives change and success in a community, all you have to do is look at the educational institutions there. Miami, in my view, is in so, so many ways a microcosm of America and the opportunities and challenges of American education. You all know the story, of course. Miami-Dade College is the largest institution of higher education in the United States, and in my view, known for its welcoming approach to transformative learning opportunities. FIU is the fifth largest and recognized as a world-class teaching and research institution. Florida Memorial University is one of the oldest and most symbolically important HBCUs in the country, with origins going back to 1879. And of course, at the K-12 level, We have many great examples, but of course, the Miami-Dade County Public School System is the fourth largest in the country and nationally regarded in areas like teacher quality. But you know what, I think what may distinguish this community as much as the size and reach of its education system is that it represents the potential and promise of a nation. Simply put, Miami-Dade County is where the rest of the country is going. Rich in diversity, with more than half of the population born outside the U.S., Innovation and optimism thrive. Your strengths include business sectors that are fueling the future, such as finance, healthcare, and high tech. And with a population that grew 15% over the past decade, and unemployment that I think is still under 3%, a lot of young workers are hungry to make a contribution here in Miami. By solving problems here, you can solve problems that our entire country is going to need to come to grips with. You have an opportunity to develop a uniquely diverse, highly qualified, and skilled workforce. The question here, and frankly, this is a question I get a lot when I'm traveling around the country and talking with business leaders and education leaders like all of you, is how to do that. And that's what I want to explore with you today and then, what's, and then hear what's, what's really on all of your minds. 
You should take confidence in the breadth of the organizations that are here representing the great work that Matt and the team are leading uh, on behalf of, of the community. The mix of education, social sector, business and tech leaders gathered here is exactly the kind of partnership that's required to develop the talent that we need to build a prosperous future. Now you may come at talent from many different angles, some because you need workers with more advanced skills, some because you know it's the key to social mobility, some because you believe in fostering greater equity. But these perspectives are all critical to developing workers for the future. Lumina Foundation shares that perspective with all of you. Lumina is the largest private foundation in the country focused solely on making more opportunities for learning beyond high school available to all Americans. We support, we support many different types of educational institutions, four and two year institutions, workforce based training programs, and many other types of learning opportunities after high school. And we are deeply unapologetically focused on being an equity first national leader working to ensure that all Americans have the opportunity afforded by education after high school. Let's be clear, collectively, we have our work cut out for us. Among our challenges, enrollment in colleges and universities in the US is down nearly 5% from a year ago. The late, latest National Student Clearinghouse report shows that total post-secondary enrollment fell by about 680,000 students in the spring of 2022 and nearly double that figure, some 1.3 million, over the past two years. Of course, the effects of COVID on higher education have not been equally distributed. Some institutions are, in fact, enjoying record enrollments, and others are closing their doors. Some are successfully expanding student diversity, while others are struggling with losses. Without question, community colleges have been the hardest hit, with an enrollment drop of almost 8% a decline that represents more than half of the post-secondary enrollment uh, losses in the country. Since the start of the pandemic, community colleges nationally have lost nearly 20% of students between the ages of 18 and 24, and 16% of adult students, with women declining the most among those enrollments. Most concerning are the data showing dramatically lower numbers of black and Hispanic students in two-year college programs. Black enrollment is down nearly 25% at two-year colleges since the start of the pandemic, and Hispanic enrollment fell nearly 15%. The equity gaps are getting wider at a time when closing them is, in my view, key to our collective prosperity. This is troubling news. And while the pandemic has made things worse, we know that enrollment has been trending down for a much longer period of time. There were already two and a half million fewer students at colleges and universities nationally when COVID hit than there were in 2012. So that 1.3 million number that I just cited, that's on top of the 2.5 million that we lost in the prior decade. Along with the relentless mutations of COVID, Americans feel battered by any number of crises, intractable racial inequities and injustices, an epidemic of gun violence <clears throat> in our shared, cherished, and, and essential public places, and growing concerns about the future of our democracy. And yet the stagnation of the number of Americans with the education required to participate and prosper in today's economy is, I think, an existential threat equal to all of these other challenges. Writer John Marcus laid out what's at stake earlier this year in an article uh, uh, in a publication called The Heckinger Report. He wrote, first, people without education past high school earn significantly less than those with bachelor's degrees and are more likely to be unemployed and live in poverty. And second, people with all types of post-secondary credentials, um, who, who lack all types of post-secondary credentials, are more prone to depression, live shorter lives, need more government assistance, pay less in taxes, divorce more frequently, and vote and volunteer less often. Last week's report of the sharpest two-year decline in U.S. life expectancy in 100 years due to a combination of COVID and increasing deaths of despair, I think is only the latest confirmation of that. To the list I just mentioned, I'm going to add two more. First, people without education past high school are more vulnerable to the allure of authoritarianism that I think is an ongoing threat to our democracy. And second, lack of high quality attainment weakens our position among our global competitors. 
the U.S. has fallen from second to 16th among OECD countries in the proportion of 25 to 34-year-olds with post-secondary credentials. Now, the dominant media narrative around declining enrollment is that students no longer value a college degree. The problem with this narrative is that it's largely wrong. In fact, our recent Gallup Lumina Foundation shows the opposite. There's high demand and interest in all types of post-high school learning, but many can neither access nor afford it. We found that 85% of students who stopped out of college amid the pandemic actually want to return to school. Over half, about 56% of those who were enrolled before the pandemic are considering coming back, and 40% of those who never enrolled say they want to enroll. Students told Gallup they aren't enrolling or staying in school not because they question the value, but because they're worried about finances. They're buried in debt. They, they feel tremendous stress, particularly among currently enrolled students. In fact, among currently enrolled students, a whopping 76% say stress has led them to consider dropping out, a huge increase compared to a few years ago. Many also feel unprepared academically and struggle with heavy family and work obligations. In other words, most students believe college is worth it, but money and stress are holding them back. So clearly we have our work cut out for us when it comes to reaching today's students and bringing them off the sidelines. And as disruptive as COVID has been, our challenges are far, far broader. The worlds of education and work have been transforming as dramatically as have today's students. Now in my book on human work, which is now almost two years old, uh, I, I struck some themes that I think feel even more current, uh, particularly after our social stress test of the pandemic experience. We know and see everywhere around us that work is changing in unprecedented ways as technology and artificial intelligence take over more and more of the tasks that people used to do. President Pumariega made this very point. We know that society is being thrust into this new era of human work, the work that only humans can do. It's, re it's work that requires ethics and compassion, creativity and critical thinking, problem solving, interpersonal communications, and more. Now, some refer to these as soft skills, and President Pumariega is right. In my book, I refer to them as human skills, but maybe there's a third term we should use. Let's call them durable skills. They're durable because of their lasting value. And we know that because in survey after survey, employers, like many of you in this room, tell us that's exactly what they're looking for as people who possess those skills. Human workers will be learning, earning, and serving during the course of their lifetimes, participating in a virtuous cycle that I think expands human potential and allows all of us to make a difference. So just as the discussions among all of you in this room and various forums in which you participate often focus on the connection between education and work, so too my work at Lumina Foundation, which is focused on large-scale national systemic change in education and training after high school, sparked my interest in this idea of the work of the future. Now, a lot of people talk about the future of work. I talk about the work of the future, and I'm not trying to be a semanticist here in quibbling about words, because I think we have to acknowledge that the very idea of work actually matters to Americans. When people say future of work, it's sometimes as if they're questioning the basic idea of work itself. Now think about how that's often played out. Over the last decade, we've seen an almost obsessive focus on the so-called future of work in the media, in books, in academic studies, and in policy discussions. Most fall in what I've called the robot zombie apocalypse view of the world. Uh, you all know it, right? The robots are coming to eat our jobs, uh, massive job loss fueled by rapid advances in AI, etc. But at the end of the day, we know that technology has always played a role in both job creation and job destruction. And it's very well possible that technology could create millions of new jobs as it always has in the past. At the same time, while machines are changing how we work, we also change, uh, face a tsunami of change in the way that workers view work. Now, the, the results of a recent survey from Miami University in Ohio, I can't believe they call themselves Miami, 
are, are illuminating. Not surprisingly, the data show that in the current employee market, workers have an emboldened sense of choice and control over how they work. And the survey shows that the so-called great resignation is more like a great reprioritization. Instead of accepting what they can't change, workers are changing what they can no longer accept. The results of this survey show a wide understanding of what we've been talking about. Workers more than ever see their jobs as much more than just a paycheck. Work brings meaning to our lives, and human work draws from the unique knowledge, skills, and abilities that we bring to this work. Human work is about learning and serving as well as earning. Uh, along with their pay, people crave knowledge and the chance to give back and serve their communities. And as AI and automation take over the repetitive tasks of our lives, our future leaders and workers need to remember that human work becomes less about specialized expertise and more about applying that broad-based knowledge that's needed that President Pumariega pointed out. Moreover, people want more control over their lives and are reprioritizing work itself what we used to refer to as work-life balance is now being viewed more and more by workers as life-work balance. What's clear then is to turn the tide of declining enrollment, we have to accelerate change, transforming policies and practices to serve the needs of today's students, today's learners, who are older, who are more diverse, and who are often stretched thin on time, on money, and on support. As you know so well, nearly half of today's students pay their own bills, a quarter are raising their own children, and nearly two-thirds work. 40% of today's college students today work uh, half-time. So let's stop telling ourselves that the problem isn't that people don't value college degrees, and instead focus on the real barriers that keep them from enrolling in the first place. A lack of adequate financial aid, cumbersome bureaucratic barriers, a lack of clear pathways to, to careers, and a lack of other supports that today's learners really need from childcare to food banks to mental health counseling. Also troubling, I think, is the fact that equity gaps are growing at the very time that we need them to shrink. You know, I think we all recognize that COVID has put a spotlight on the fact that the promise of American opportunity has always been in sharp contrast with our nation's legacy of racial discrimination. Our long overdue racial reckoning may have been sparked by the murders of George Floyd and countless others, but the root causes reach back more than a century. Lack of access to quality learning after high school, learning complemented by academic, financial, and social supports has denied millions of African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, and others the opportunities that they need to advance economically and to secure good jobs. Florida is a really good case in point. On the one hand, educational attainment in the state, when we include both degrees and other types of post high school credentials like certificates and certifications, is about 53%, a little bit higher than the, than the national average. Uh, this is a healthy increase uh, compared to 2009, and it puts the state on a reasonable path to get within striking distance of the 60% goal that Lumina Foundation has been trying to catalyze the country towards since uh, 2008, when, by the way, the nation was at 38%. However, part of the story in Florida, similar to the story that we see across the country, is one of unrealized potential. While a growing proportion of today's learners are black, Hispanic, and Latino, and Native American, attainment rates persistently lag national averages. In Florida, while attainment for Asian or Pacific Islanders is 62% and for whites it's 46%, for Hispanics it's only 37%, and for African Americans, 31%. Here in Miami-Dade County, the incredibly diverse population of residents find themselves behind the national goals and trends and reflect the overall state trajectory. About 42% of residents hold an associate degree or higher here in Miami-Dade County. Quite frankly, and I want to be clear about this, that's not good enough for the state's largest population center and its engine of opportunity and wealth creation. The math, I think, is self-evident and it's inexorable. We can't sustain the growth trajectory that Miami-Dade County, the state of Florida, and our country have enjoyed for 75 years 
unless we bring more people off of the sidelines. Simply put, it's incumbent upon all of us doing this vital work to do a better job preparing all of our fellow citizens for human work. A study by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco calculated that the country's output would be $2.6 trillion greater if the gap in educational attainment between white men and everyone else was closed. So let me conclude by saying that this rhetoric about the so-called future of work, that might be overblown a bit, but I do want to say one thing, which is that it's not all hype in the sense that the changes that we've seen in work so far have been dramatic, and I think COVID has accelerated the worth of change in just a few years, and I think it's likely that even bigger changes are in store for us. And unless we act to urgently address them and redress, redress these stubborn imbalances that we've analyzed from many angles but haven't adequately solved, the future of our economy, for that matter, of our very pluralistic democratic existence, I think is at risk. Despite that risk, I want to end by telling you that I actually am hopeful. Because as I've examined the implications of human work in coming times, I believe that I've seen that rather than representing the end of work, the work of the future is going to draw on our unique abilities as humans. It will blend our desire for learning and for earning and for serving others to contribute to a greater whole rooted in our cherished democratic freedoms and opportunities. So rather than lamenting the end of work, we must meet the mandate of drawing on what makes us different from the machines that we are now working alongside. Our challenge as leaders and as educators is to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to develop his or her unique uh, capabilities uh, throughout life. By preparing people for meaningful human work, we can instill hope and confidence in ourselves, in our communities, and ultimately in our future. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, you can find us online at opportunity.miami. You can reach us at next at opportunity.miami by email. And please keep an eye out for our series with the Academic Leaders Council, where each of our the six presidents of our college and universities, our superintendent of schools, and the mayor of Miami-Dade County, Daniela Levine Cava, will each author an essay on building Miami's next generation workforce. I hope you check it out and hope to hear from you soon. Thank you.